investing with environmental, social, and governance concerns in mind has been a growing trend. But amid fears of slowing economic growth and risks to energy security, will that momentum continue? Joining us now for more, John McEwen, Climate Risk Analyst at TD Asset Management. John, welcome to the program. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be here. So this has been an interesting space and one that's been building momentum over the years, but it's always interesting in times of turmoil, which we're definitely in right now, and some of the risks that are presented out there for uh, consumers and for companies. What does ESG investing look like in this environment? Sure. You're, you're absolutely right. It's been a very challenging year for the markets overall. And for ESG, uh, you know, this is the real kind of first challenging market we've seen since it's become a part of the mainstream investment language. Um, and so, yeah, certainly with its challenges, folks are wondering how it's going to hold up over the course of the year. And, you know, it's not just from an economic perspective right now. You know, you're seeing some politicization of ESG in the United States, some states really pushing back on the concept, as well as energy security uh, looming large in Europe, you know, all of which is creating headwinds for the space. But, you know, I'd say encouragingly so far, um, we're seeing some positive signs of resilience for ESG investing overall. First of all, if we just look at interest in the space, um, you know, relative to normal funds or non-sustainable funds, ESG has actually continued to see inflows throughout the, the course of the year globally. It's slowing inflows. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't grown like it has in recent years, which is to be expected. But you know, whereas the, the non-sustainable funds, we've seen outflows starting to happen, particularly in the third quarter. Um, so I think that bodes well as a sign of just interest in the space. But you know, everybody's interested in performance too. And so what we see so far, uh, you know, within the US, when we look at a broad base ESG US index, um, it's actually outperformed the S&P by 5% this year. It's only down 19%. This was as of Friday, so everything's green today. But, uh, you know, as of Friday, it was only down 19% versus the S&P, which was down 24. Similar story in Canada so far. Um, not quite as much outperformance, but it's remained relatively steady with uh, the S&P TSX index. So, um, so far, ESG has proved to be resilient uh, in the face of this market downturn. We're not through it yet, though, um, so we'll continue to, to watch the space and see how investors feel about ESG. Now, the energy security component of all this, and obviously critics of ESG have sort of uh, grabbed onto that piece of it. It is interesting, and we know that there's parts of, of the world, including probably Europe first and foremost, that are facing some pretty serious concerns. At the same time, does ESG investing have to be the enemy of energy security, as some people have framed it? Uh, no, I don't think so, and I would say most people within the space wouldn't think so as well. Certainly, you know, there are folks within ESG investing that um, you know, really push the climate agenda hard and anything that would increase global emissions should be avoided. In our case, you know, we view it from a couple different lenses. There's the economic lens, but there's also the human lens here. Um, you know, when folks can't heat their homes or can't afford to heat their homes, it's gonna cost them a fortune. You know, there's a human element there that should be incorporated within ESG. And we should be able to provide energy security people need to be able to last through the winter this year. Um, you know, from our perspective, it's been certainly a challenging um, you know, a few months in this regard, we are starting to see coal plants reopen, which is, uh, you know, the number one enemy of climate change. Um, but again, politicians are doing what they need to do to keep their people heated and happy in, uh, you know, what could potentially be a cold European winter. From a Canadian perspective, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do to help out. At this point, you know, Europe is really in need of gas. Um, and Canada, unfortunately, right now, doesn't really have a good way to get our natural gas to Europe. Currently, the only real way to do it is to ship it from Alberta down to the Gulf Coast and then via tanker over to Europe. Uh, so it's not the most effective or cost-efficient route to get there. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the um, LNG terminal that's being built up in BC. That won't come online for a few years. And even then, that's positioned to go to, to Asia, not Europe. So unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do. And I guess the question for governments, uh, companies, and folks in Europe and Canada uh, to wrestle with right now is, should we build that infrastructure now to get that natural gas to Europe? Not really certain about when it will come online and if that demand will still be there. Um, or should we look to cleaner forms of energy and getting uh, those to Europe? And so I think that's what you're starting to see. We just saw the German Chancellor uh, meet with Trudeau in Newfoundland, and they set up a pact to export clean hydrogen from Canada's east coast to, uh, to Europe, which 
you know, will likely come online around 2025 if everything goes well. And so we're starting to see that, um, you know, long-term forecast. It's going to be hopefully more positioned towards renewable uh, rather than continued use of fossil fuels. When I think about ESG and sort of like building in that direction, sometimes I simplify my mind to either what the politicians are saying we need to do and what the corporate world is saying. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, governments can change, you know, perhaps every four years, even before that, if you have a minority government. Well, what seems to be one of our stable spaces now, the, the corporate commitment to ESG or the, the political commitment? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, I'd say we're starting to see it, it almost goes hand in hand, you know, right now with the, the government that's in, in Canada, they have a very strong and ambitious climate agenda. And because of that, the corporate uh, commitments are following suit. Um, you know, we've recently seen a, poten a potential cap on oil and gas emissions in Canada. And so, you know, oil company, energy companies are racing to sort of keep up with that. Um, but at the same time, I can tell you from our engagements with energy companies, you know, which is obviously a focus of the E portion of ESG, there is a real um, focus and interest on decarbonizing their businesses. They know that this is the trend the world is going and that, you know, in order to remain competitive, they have to lower the carbon intensity of the energy they're producing. So they can do that in a number of ways, but to be, to be perfectly frank, I do believe that the commitment is there and we are seeing earnest uh, attempts from large emitting companies to uh, to lower the carbon footprint. You did mention the fact that E being the environmental component of the ESG, does it overshadow the rest? You know, uh, many times when we have these conversations about ESG, I sort of forget, oh yeah, the social and the governance part too. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I'd say historically probably E has been the, uh, absorbed the most attention from ESG. Um, you know, that's probably because um, Climate change is tangible and people can really see and feel the effects of it right now. And so it's a top of mind for everybody, but it's not to diminish the role of S&G. And I think, you know, as we were talking about entering a period of economic downturn, uh, G is particularly important. So those companies that are well governed, you know, those are the ones that are positioned to do the best in an economic downturn. They should have the strongest risk management practices in place and be able to withstand, um, you know, potential downturns like this. So it's. While E is important, it's certainly not to take away from the importance of S&G as well, and you know we see it a lot, a lot right now.